Okay, um, we are in the book of Genesis, and we are in chapter 4, and we'll also deal with chapter 5 tonight. And everybody calls chapter 4 the first murder, but that's a mistake. In fact, to be frank with you, there are certain chapters in the Bible that I'm sort of astonished uh, how the majority of commentators miss some of the key points. Uh, generally, you can, you, can, you, you can skim the, the, the conservative commentaries and get a pretty good handle, and, and, and here and there you pick up a loose end, but pretty much they're in center line. This is one that, uh, this is a chapter, in fact, I, I'd be willing to say that this could classify as one of the most misunderstood chapters in the Bible. And uh, the, uh, we're going to deal with some issues that, that undergird uh, this whole issue. We're all familiar with the story of how Cain murdered his brother Abel. But the real question is why, what was behind it, what was really going on, and what lessons can we can learn from this. And one of the things that lurks behind this that you can talk about on your way home is why do men hate? Why do men hate? And that's the root issue that lurks behind this whole issue. So uh, in the book of Genesis, of course, we spent quite a few weeks on, the, on the, what we call the creation week, uh, chapters 1 and 2. We spent about eight sessions on that. And then last time in chapter 3, it was the seed plot of the whole Bible. Genesis chapter 3, the fall of man, the predicament of man. And I might add the predicament of God, because God loves us, and yet he put us in a predicament that nothing less than the death of God would prevail to get us out of that predicament. So he lays down a plan, and that plan is defined right at the beginning and uh, leads from a tree in the garden to a tree in Golgotha. But tonight, we're going to take a look at chapters 4 and 5. Now, for those of you that have been a little apprehensive, figuring it took us eight sessions to get through one chapter, um, and it's, you know, it's 50 chapters, you probably figured we'll be here for the duration. Actually, we'll start, the, the pace will pick up a little bit as this gets more into a, a, a regular narrative. But clearly, the first 11 chapters of Genesis are a unit of their own. In fact, there are many books written that are called the first 11 chapters of Genesis because they're distinctive. From uh, chapter 12 on, it's the call of Abraham and the patriarchs, the history of Israel, and so forth. But those first 11 chapters are back in the misty era that some people call prehistory. And uh, so we're in that area, of course. But chapters 4 and 5, the, the story of Cain and Abel is where we're at. Now, one of the things, there is a danger. You know, when we have a Bible story that we've never looked at or some nuance that we've never seen, there's a good chance you can pick up its significance. The troublesome places are the ones that are very familiar, and yet we may have missed the point. And chapter 4 is one of those. We all know the story. You know, Cain and Abel. Cain's offering wasn't accepted. Abel's was, so he was jealous, so he killed his brother. What's the big deal? Well, what I'm going to suggest you do is set aside for the moment whatever presumptions or presuppositions you have about the chapter 4. The only, the only certain barrier to truth is the presumption you already have it. And uh, that's what Edmund Spencer said it in a little more elaborate form. He says, there is a principle which is a bar against all information. It's a proof against all argument. And it cannot fail to keep man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is condemnation, or I might say prejudgment, before investigation. And so th sometimes, especially, especially regarding a Bible story you know well, it's often more difficult to set aside and try to see it through fresh eyes. So that's what we're going to try to do here. So let's just jump in. But before we get into chapter 4, let's refresh a little bit of the closing chapters of chapter 3 last time. Just to, We've had a little bit of a break here with the holiday period and so forth. Let's, let's focus here. In Genesis chapter 3, uh, Adam called his wife's name Eve, verse 20, because she was the mother of all living. Now indeed she was in a biological sense, but in another sense she's also going to end up becoming that in a spiritual sense, because this, the seed of the woman is one of the titles of Christ. And the woman we're talking about is Eve in the sense that she's the first Israeli. Now, she obviously wasn't, Abraham isn't called, but the thread, what I sometimes call the scarlet thread, from Eve and her offspring to the cross is a thread that ties the whole Bible together. So she's the mother of all living in a biological sense, of course, since we all are descendants of Adam and Eve. But uh, 
She's also the mother of all living in another sense, in the sense of Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 being a summary of this whole theme. We talked about that last time. And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin, skins and clothing. Remember, when they were conscious of their failure, their sin, the first thing they did is try to cover themselves. Aprons of fig leaves, remember? That was the first act of religion on the planet Earth. Religion is man's attempt to cover himself, man's attempt to reconcile himself with God. And that is always a failure. Religion is always failure. The most anti-religious person that ever walked the planet Earth is the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember I said that on a secular stop, uh, a talk show in Great Britain, and I won the host, a host that is known for being irascible to his guests. He somehow, from that day on, has always treated me with respect because he, he, he could relate to that because he understands the, the, some of the, 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 the frustrations they have over there with their clergy. But the, the fact that Jesus Christ is anti-religious is a key point. People say, gee, you're religious. I know how they're using that term, but in the technical sense, we, couldn't be, we, we seek to be very anti-religious. Religion is man's attempt to cover himself, and God, even here in the Garden of Eden, is teaching them a lesson by replacing their self-made garments with the coats of skins. And you may miss that until you've read the rest of the Bible and come back to it. But God is teaching them by, by the shedding of innocent blood they would be covered. And that is going to be the underlying fact of chapter 4. You won't understand the Cain and Abel story unless you understand that this little hint we have in verse 20 of chapter 3 is indicative of not just a pragmatic thing to give them warm clothes, but rather God himself personally teaching them that by the shedding of blood they would be covered. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a moral lesson in that. And only by the innocent blood would they be covered. It's Leviticus 17.11, and it is the theme that leads to the cross. It is the theme that qualifies Jesus Christ in Revelation 5 to take the seven-sealed book. The lamb as it had been slain. Now, these fig, what kind of fig leaves are we talking about? You and I don't run around fig leaves. Yes, we do. We look to church going, religious exercises, following rules or ordinances, don't drink or smoke, whatever. Philanthropy, boy, we give regularly to all these wonderful, wonderful charities. Altruism in general. Personal efforts, danger, danger, danger. All of that is contrast to the completed 100% work of Jesus Christ. Not that these things aren't worth doing, but they don't impact your salvation. Jesus did the 100% of it. And for you to try to add to that is blasphemy. That's something only God could do, and uh, we're going to understand that better after chapter 4. The cross is what our reliance is not on the regularity of our Sunday school attendance or whatever. It's the, the, our reliance 100% on the completed work of God himself. There are two trees. The cross is talked as a tree in, in Acts and 1 Peter. They're both in a garden, Garden of Eden, garden uh, adjacent to the garden tomb. The curse is linked to a tree in Galatians 3. The baker, remember, baker, baker's hanged in chapter 40. We'll get to that later in Genesis. Haman was hanged, remember? Uh, it, it says in, in, in Esther, you always hear Haman being hanged. That's a mistranslation. He wasn't hanged. He was impaled. He was impaled. He was crucified. The Persians invented crucifixion. The Romans adopted it widely. But uh, anyway, there's more to that whole story. Study our, our commentary. The, these two trees are contrary. They're both planted by God. One is planted by God, one by man. Uh, both pleasant to the eyes. One had no beauty. They should die as art. One was forbidden. One was commanded to eat of. Satan enticed the one. Satan tries to prevent the other. The one brought sin and death. The other brought life and salvation. So there's a contrast between the tree that we talked about, tree of life, and uh, the, the, uh, the tree that's at Golgotha. Anyway, let's, we, and then as we went on in, in Genesis, finishing it up, so the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, that means experientially, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever in his sin. You follow me? Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim. The King James has cherubims plural, but that's uh, cherubim itself is a plural noun. Cherub is singular, cherubim is plural. But the, anyway, and a, uh, a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. 
Now, by the way, that translation is a little misleading. Many people, we all have these little pictures. I almost, I, I was, I almost included one in our slides here, but I didn't want to reinforce that image. Um, of, of a big flaming angel at the Garden of Eden and Adam Eve cowering as if he's there keeping them out. That's sort of the picture you have from the Sunday school books. How many have seen those kinds of pictures? Yeah, well, it, that's not what it really says, you see. In the Jerusalem Targum, see, the word uh, he placed, the word placed there is actually 83 times translated dwelt or tabernacled. God tabernacled east of the Garden of Eden between the cherubim. That's what the Hebrew really says. And all through the Old Testament, when you speak of the Ark of the Covenant, God is visualized, at least idiomatically, as dwelling between the cherubim. Same term here. Uh, as a tongue of fire, the Shekinah glory, to keep open the way to the tree of life. See, the tri the, the, uh, I, I didn't have the benefit of this originally. I since have found these Jewish sources which clarify this. But I always puzzled me, why did God put a cherubim to guard the way to the tree of life? That's silly. It doesn't take a super angel to do that. One angel would be ample. To keep, if, it's, if the goal is to keep Adam and Eve out, one angel is an overkill. One angel slaughtered 185,000 Syrians one evening after dinner. You don't mess with angels. This is a cherubim. There's only five of them in the Bible. Four that guard God's throne and Lucifer, who was originally the guy in charge of the cherubim. He's now, he's of course... Got a little career problem, problem but um, <laughs> the cherry bim are always guard. So this, the image that's really presented here to the ancient rabbis is God dwelt east of Eden, and 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 the cherry bim are there to guard the way to the tree of life, so that it will be available to you and I once Christ has completed His redemption. Are we together? Now I don't want to oversell that. That's a view that's held by the ancient Jew Hebrew scholars. And it's one that is consistent, as we see it, with other New Testament teachings. But I bring it to you, not to sell it to you, but to, make, to stretch your horizon. Don't get confused by verse 24. Many verses, especially in these early parts of Genesis, uh, are, are, are easy to jump to too many conclusions about. Now, to guard the way to the tree of life. Remember, as you read your New Testament, how it, God's program for mankind through Jesus Christ is repeatedly called the way in Acts 9.2, Acts 16.17, Acts 18.25 and 26, 19 and so forth. The way, he explained the way to them. Now we, we call it spreading the gospel or explaining the plan of salvation. That's, so those are our idioms. In the Bible, it was called the way, God's way. The way that God has established that you and I will have access ultimately to the tree of life as Adam had before he fell, and as we find in the book of Revelation, once again being accessible to us. And uh, so we, th there's some very, very important roots laid down here, but let us move on. Now, so Genesis chapter, we're now to chapter 4, verse 1. Adam knew his wife Eve. No, it's Eve, it's not Steve. Uh, Adam knew his Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Now, the word Cain is usually associated with the Hebrew word kana, which means to acquire or beget. Cain means begotten. Seems strange, straightforward enough. Uh, and I've, got, I've begotten a man from the Lord. Now, from Eve's, Eve's point of view, she probably would be justified in presuming this was the response to God's promise out of the seed of the woman. And here's her seed. Oh, she, she probably figured, she didn't realize there's several thousand years yet to come, but but uh, she, she, Cain, Cain was firstborn, okay, and I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. There are some Jewish rabbis, ancient scholars, that suspect they were twin twins. It doesn't say that. I think that's going beyond the text, but there are, the, there are those views. We don't know the age difference between them. And there's no emphasis in the scripture, so <clears throat> I mentioned only in passing. She again bare his brother Abel. And Abel or Hebel means a feeder or a keeper of, of, of sheep and so forth. Uh, Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now because one was a shepherd and one was a farmer, that leads many commentators to presume that that has something to do with the offerings they brought, and that really betrays a lack of insight or background on the part of the commentators. Yes, <clears throat> Cain was a tiller of the ground, and he brought... For, to offer fruit of the ground. 
okay, but it was a cursed ground as the fruits of his labor. So there's important, there's important distinctions here. Uh, Abel happened to keep sheep, but the fact that he was offering a sheep may have a far deeper significance than the fact that he was a shepherd. And I'll get, 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 get into that as we go. Just be alert to that. You'll discover there's a presumption on the part of most Bible commentaries that that has to do with why they pick their particular offerings. And uh, that's, un, uh, that's, in a sense, an adverse pun. It came, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Now, fundamentally, there's nothing wrong with that. That would seem okay. But uh, we want to go back here. The, you know, one of the best commentators you can get on the Scripture is what? The scripture, you betcha. And so let's take a look at the, this interesting passage in Luke 11, starting about verse 49. Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them shall, they shall slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation. Jesus here is letting them have it. Luke 11. From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple, verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Abel, I'm going to suggest to you, from the scripture, is the first prophet. Abel's a prophet. Why do I say that? Because Jesus called him that. He's talking here about the prophets, the blood of all the prophets. And he mentions from Abel to Zacharias. That's an incident that occurs at the end of the Old Testament period. Um, uh, Jesus make reference to him this way. And Abel, so let's watch Abel, is going to have a role, whether he realizes it or not, as a prophet. Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Okay, gang. Many of you have been with me uh, through other portions of the Torah. I want you to play detective. Do you find something in verse 4 that seems to be a clue of some kind? A clue to something, what a, what a rabbi would call a remez, a hint of something deeper. What do you notice in verse 4? Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. And then goes on about Cain. What do you notice in verse 4? Did anybody see a strange phrase there? Very good. Right here, let's say it again. The fat thereof. Where does that echo from? Hmm? You may not remember, it was a Leviticus 3.16. What that implies here, you know, he offered the firstlings of his flock, and the fat thereof. The reason that echoes in your ears, if you've studied the Torah, the five books of Moses, is that's a repeated phrase having to do with the ritual, the ordinances having to do with the ritual of giving an offering. What that tells you, I believe, is that what Abel is doing here is not simply bringing him a sheep because he's a shepherd. He is fulfilling a requirement that had some procedural requirements. And uh, we talked a great deal when we were in chapter 2 that the, the concept of the Sabbath day was not, did not originate in the book of Exodus of the Ten Commandments. In fact, the commandment says, remember the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day was, was um, uh, uh, instituted long before there was a Jewish nation. Now, it becomes a very characteristic emblem of the Jewish nation later. But the point is, the Sabbath day was clearly ordained in chapter 2. And what I often love to point out, and we'll point out when we get to chapter 6, you know, how many of each animal did Noah take into the ark? But he says, well, of course, two. The naive person says, well, two of every animal. Those that have done a little more harm. He says, no, 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 there were seven of each of the clean. Right, seven of the clean, two of the unclean. Why seven of the clean? Well, we guessed for, 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 for offerings that when, when the, the, the thing is over. But the real question is, how did Noah know what's clean and unclean? Those are ritual definitions. Noah knew what was clean and unclean. That was long before Moses, long before the, the Levitical ordinances were codified. But what does it tell us? Those ideas were embodied back in Eden. And I'm going to suggest to you that apparently Adam and Eve had instruction from God as how he would be worshipped. <clears throat> and Abel is conforming to that by offering a lamb and the fat thereof. This is a formalized offering. 
And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. But unto Cain and his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. Cain is really upset. His pride's been hurt. He's been upstaged. We all have had that feeling. We may not like to admit it, but we've all had that feeling of envy, jealousy, whatever. Well, this raises another peculiar question. How'd they know? Now, some of you may have put offerings in our offering box coming in here or when you, when you leave. Now, you can probably have a high degree of confidence if your check doesn't bounce, your offering will be accepted, right? <laughs> but, you know, we go through our procedures with our various ministries. If the plate passes the church. You don't really know whether your offering you put in that plate is acceptable to God or not. You know, you can have a high degree of confidence that the administration will dutifully uh, uh, cash the check and apply it to their budget. Uh, that, that, that isn't a real anxiety on your part. But if you're really spiritually sensitive, you might say, gee, how do I know God really accepts my offering? You know, it, it, if you're spiritually discerning, that's an issue. If you have some sin in your life, if there's something you're allowing in your life that offends God, you know, that offering uh, in, a, in, a, in a spiritual sense is maybe not acceptable to him. You have some things you have to deal with. Well, how, how, can Cain, how, 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 does, how did uh, Cain and Abel know that their offerings were acceptable or not? Apparently, they were very, it was very pragmatically obvious because Cain is upset. He's crushed. Well, that implies something else. They knew right away. How'd they know? It may come as a surprise to you and me that God, apparently, on a number of occasions, visibly received their offering. Moses and Aaron, Leviticus 9, fire came down and consumed the offering. Wow, read chapter 9, verse 24 in Leviticus. Gideon, same thing happened. Fire from heaven came down and took his offering in chapter 6 of the book of Judges. Samson's parents, Manoah and so forth, same thing. The fire came down and picked up their office. Elijah, remember, we all know about Mount Carmel. That's a dramatic state, you know, thing. The golfers all know about Mount Carmel because Elijah had a handicap, right? <laughs> you know, douse it you know, with, with, with water and so forth first, you know. <laughs> I'll make a record in my Bible teaching. I won't use this as an excuse to get into that whole story because it'll take us too long this evening. But the whole, King, 1 Kings 18 is... Uh, you know, I, 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 it's, a, it's a tragedy that Cecil B. DeMille died because this is one that he missed. He would, have done, he would have done this thing right. Of course, now with computer graphics, it's easier. But anyway, <clears throat> David, 1 Chronicles 21, his offering was accepted by fire from heaven. 1 Chronicles 21, Solomon, his second Chronicles 7. It astonished me, and I found six. I'm sure there's a seventh one I've overlooked, you know. But there are occasions in the scripture where God reaches down. And I guess I, I could argue that the seventh one would be Abel, the one I should take the first one. That would give me my nice little neat seven. But anyway, the net, the net of it is, is that uh, God apparently on occasion has fire come, come down from heaven. And uh, so um, I don't think the absence of fire in our present church service is an indicator. Don't, don't, I wouldn't, don't, 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 don't misquote me now. Um, but... Um, so they apparently understood very, very dramatically. Apparently in those days, it was very obvious whether God accepted it or not. And Cain is really upset because his offering was not acceptable. The Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? So here is a loving father seeking to, to save a, a fallen sinner. Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? If thou doest not, sin lieth at the door. Now, the term here for sin lieth at the door seems to portray the idea of it crouching at the door ready to leap on him. And the and commentaries are full of discussions how sin can grab you and get you in a position where you are, it's no longer even voluntary anymore. If you let it in, it takes over, so to speak. And that's all valid. Except the problem is, the, the rabbinical view of this is that what is really alluded to here is if there's a problem, there is a sin offering that will fix it. There's a sin offering. 
And so it's, it, it, in the English translation, that isn't as clear. But in the Hebrew, the, 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 some of the experts believe what he's really saying here is if you, gotta, if, if, you, if you do well, fine. But if not, there's a sin, that's what the sin offering is for, you see. But then he says something else, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. In other words, he's also pointing out Cain is the firstborn. This implies uh, primogeniture, that the firstborn is going to rule. If, every, if all things being equal, Cain is going to be in charge. He's the heir apparent. He's the firstborn son. So what's the problem? The Proverbs tell us that where there is contention, there's pride. There's pride. And Cain is upset. When we get to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 4, it says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. What made Abel's sacrifice more acceptable, more excellent than Cain's? Because he was following the specifications that God had given his parents, that God had ordained the offering of a lamb. Because the lamb's significant? No, but it's prophetic. Just as all the offerings in the book of Leviticus that we went through in such tedious detail during our study of Leviticus, they all in various ways point to aspects of the lamb that had been slain on the cross. And when you get to the book of Revelation, and there's a seventh sealed book of him that sitteth on the throne, sealed within and on, uh, in and on the backside. And the word goes out, who is worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof? And John says, I sobbed convulsively because no man, had to be a man, had to be a kinsman, no man was able to take the book and loose the seals thereof. And wept convulsively. And one of the elders said, look, weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed. The root of David hath prevailed. To The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David hath prevailed to open the book and loose the seals thereof. And John says, he looked, he doesn't see a lion. He saw the lamb as it had been slain. I believe that when he looked there, he saw nail prints and a wounded side and, and uh, facial issues, scars from the, the ordeal. That all points to that. That's the climax. God went through a great deal of effort to orchestrate all the precision that was fulfilled in the cross. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Was Abel a sinner? Absolutely. Was his parents fallen? Absolutely. Were they sinners? Absolutely. Why? They died. Penalty of sin is death. So it wasn't that he was sinless, but he was righteous. How? By being able to appropriate by faith the provision God had made for his sin. It has been said by some that no, man, no one will be in heaven for their sin. No one will be in hell for their sin. They'll be in hell for rejecting the provision God made for their sin. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained a witness that he was, a right, that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it being dead, yet speaketh. That's why Abel is called a prophet. By Jesus Christ, and here by the writer Hebrews, so Abel is the first prophet. And in a certain sense of speaking, I'm going to suggest Cain was the first Pharisee. Or the first re professional religionist. The first one to try to, to, to argue in, on his own merit, or the works, of the, the works that he produced as a farmer. It's, it's, it's works versus grace right here in chapter 4. By the time you get to the book of Romans, the book of Romans is a detailed, precise development of that issue, but it has its roots in Genesis 4. Get to Hebrews 9, verse 22. Almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. A quote, in effect, from Leviticus 17:11. The shedding of blood is an issue in Genesis 3. It's an issue in Genesis 4. So, getting on to verse 8 uh, of chapter 4, Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Hmm. And again, and again, God tries to deal with this as a loving father. Cain's unbridled anger shows up, and he became, in effect, not only hostile to his brother, but an enemy of God here. And... Uh, 
So it would seem that God is trying to elicit from Cain a confession. If he would confess and repent, there was provision. God is trying to help him here. The Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? What an impudent, impudent, shameful response to a loving father. Am I my brother's keeper? The answer, of course, is yes, you are. He said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Whew. By the way, Hebrews 12, 24 says, the, the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See, this blood is crying one thing. The blood that was shed on the cross cries another. But God goes now, he says, Now thou art cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. What irony here. He's a farmer. What's the curse? The ground is not going to yield to his cultivation. There's something even stranger here. When you get through the book of Leviticus, you encounter this whole idea of lex talionis, the idea of eye for eye, tooth for tooth, as a concept, right? What was God justified in doing here? Cain is a murderer. What should God have done? Should have killed him. Why didn't he? Why, why didn't God take Cain's life, life for life? Good for you, good for you, to give him an opportunity to repent. You see, God, even here, is a God of mercy. He'll wander, he'll have his problems, but he'll have time to consider and to repent and confess and, and have a sin. And... Uh, yeah, Hebrews 12, 24, the Jesus, the, uh, and, to Jesus, and to Jesus, the mediator of, a new, of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, which speaketh better things than that of Abel. And it's interesting how God's, uh, 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 Jesus' shed blood is contrasted with Abel's. They both speak. But obviously, again, Hebrews, the whole theme in Hebrews is that Christ is preeminent. Of course, now Cain responds to this. As Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, from the, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and shall come, and shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. Really? How many people are, is he talking about? How many people do you think are alive at that time? See, you and I, we know about Adam and Eve. Seth hasn't been born yet, apparently, right? Or has he? You see, Adam and Eve had many sons and daughters. Some scholars estimate that the population even here might have been several hundred thousand. I'm not saying it was, don't misunderstand me, but you realize there's long lifetimes involved. Long lifetimes involved. We have no idea of the chronology here. This isn't the, next, this isn't the day after Tuesday or something. This is, you know, who knows. So we discover shortly that they're going to be making cities. Certain of Cain's offspring are going to make cities. See, they recognize the population has been growing. It isn't just a little family uh, living on, on a constrained piece of property here. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Now, you're going to find, if you do a little library search, all kinds of speculations on what the mark of Cain was. Um, the answer is we don't know. Speculations are rather pointless. Whatever they were, for Cain, people would like to think of certain ethnic things as being the mark of Cain and then to his descendants, except remember that whatever it was is wiped out the flood anyway. Okay? That's coming in chapter 6. Now, there is a conjecture. I, 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 won't, I won't give my conjectures about the mark of Cain except to suggest this to you. Maybe the mark wasn't something on him. It was something given to him. And uh, it, something he could rely on as a test of his faith. If he trusts that mark, he will have God's protection. 
That's a suggestion, a possibility. But in any case, um, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, dwelt in the land of Nod. And there again, the Hebrew is a little ambiguous. It's not clear whether that's speaking geographically or idiomatically. Because the land of Nod is a land of exile, land of flight. Is it a literal place east? Some people think so. Could be. Or is it just that he was in flight, a nomad? We don't know. Uh, Maybe more idiomatic than uh, geographic. Now let's talk a little bit about them. Both Cain and Abel came from the same parents. You always say, is it hereditary or is it environment? Well, they've got, they both have the same parents and the same environment, but they're opposite. They're both fallen. The parents are fallen. Cain and Abel are both fallen. They're both sinners. Abel also. Both of them are outside of Eden. This all happens after Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden. So they are judicially alienated from the presence of God. Okay. They have a different basis, though. This is where they depart. They have the, this is all what they have in common. Here's what they have in difference. One is relying on his own works, Cain, and one is, in effect, by faith, appropriating what will end up becoming the completed work of Jesus Christ. That, divides, that division divides us all. The preaching of the cross, Paul tells us, is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God unto salvation. Everybody on the planet Earth is in one of two categories. They're either saved or not saved. There are lots of divisions within each of those things. Not everybody saved is going to have the same privileges and the same rewards. That's a whole other subject. But you're either saved or you're not. If you're saved, you're saved because of your reliance on, the, on a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And the same thing's true here. Death is required, but God would provide that death, and we, that will become very dramatically demonstrated when we get to chapter 22 of Genesis, what the Hebrews call the Akedah. Let's speak of types, for example. You know, you can make a list of features of Abel. He was a shepherd. He gave an offering. He was hated by his brother. He was slain as an enemy. His blood cries out. The firstling, he gave the firstling of a flock. He received witness. You can go. I, I have a list of 35 of these, but I'm not going to give them to you because what I want you to do is make your own list and then take Jesus and contrast it with your list. He was the good shepherd. He gave an offering, John 10.1. He was hated by his brothers, plural, John 15.25. He was slain as an enemy, according to Acts 2.23. His blood also cries out, according to Mark 12.9. He is the firstling of a flock in a very real sense. First Peter uses that expression in First Peter 1.19. Both received witnesses. Jesus had his innocence declared by a centurion, by Satan as in, in, in dwelt Judas, and so forth. So you can make your own list. Get, throwing you, showing my list is useless. It's more useful for you to, to pull your own list together as a little project. I'll leave that to you. Meanwhile, let's go on with what happens to Cain. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city. Now there's a first clue that there's population around. He built a city. Called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. And unto Enoch was born Erod, and Erod begot Mehuel, and Mehuel begot Methusael, and Methusael begot Lamech. And uh, before I leave this, though, uh, we're going to go in a few more verses where he talks about the genealogy of Cain. And it's been a mystery to me. One of my little uh, frustrations is I haven't been able to figure out why God bothered putting the, the list of his descendants in chapter 4. Because when we get to chapter 6, they're going to all drown. So why are they here? Well, I tell you one thing. Um, it's very, it's become very fashionable in a lot of publications to presume that Cain was a bad guy. Certainly, he killed his brother. But I noticed something interesting that should influence our perspective on Cain. Yes, he made a big mistake, and yes, he should have repented more quickly. But God gave him a lifetime to repent by not killing him. And I want to notice that his son and his grandchildren have the name of God built in their names. You recognize in Mahuiel, the, the L, E-L, is, that's, the, that's a suffix referring to God. And we see that in his children. So it's my inference that Cain became a believer and repentant. It will not surprise me to find him in heaven when I get there. Because he may have repented because his offspring are God-fearing. That says a lot about Cain. Yes, he made a mistake, haven't we all? And yes, he didn't handle it properly. But still, I think there's lessons here, and I don't see Cain, uh, I, I, I don't see him as the most, he's not on my most wanted list. He's, he's the guy that uh, uh, 
Anyway, he begot Lamech. Now, Lamech's a strange character. Lamech took unto him two wives. This is the first example of polygamy in the Bible. may not have been the first example of it happening, but anyway. Um, the name of the one was Adah, and the, one, the other Zillah. And Ada bore Jabal, and he was the father of such who dwell in tents, and of such as have cattle. And by cattle, it means herds in general. And his brother's name was Jubal, and he was the father of all uh, such as handled the harp and the organ. So apparently, um, there are skills and artisans starting to surface in the culture here. And Zillah also bare Tubalcane, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. Wow, that puts brass and iron very early in the history of man. And the sister of Tubalcane was Naama. And Lamech said unto his wives, and by the way, here we have just a fragment of poetry. And it's, it's been the subject of a lot of scholastical uh, puzzlement. A little poem. He, he tells Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech. For I have slain a man to my wounding, and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. What does this mean? Nobody knows. There's all kinds of conjectures. None of them are very, very convincing. But according to the Jewish traditions, this uh, uh, incident with Lamech appears that he killed his son in a, unintentionally in a hunting accident. This is, this is what some of the rabbinical traditions have, have, have furthered. And uh, so uh, uh, and apparently one of the things here is this unintentional homicide has put him in no danger in contrast to Cain is the view of some of the rabbis. But anyway, that's... But we don't really know more than that. Although the word Lamech, apparently this also may be the root, the Hebrew root for the word Lamech, because we're going to have another Lamech that will be descended under Noah, and that Lamech stands for uh, despairing. And so the word itself, the root, in our, even our English language, you have the word lament. The root probably comes from, make uh, echo from these early, early records. Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. So, okay, here is, here is, is Eve. Abel's been killed. Cain has been discredited. She now is, in a sense, in a practical sense, needs another son. She, she now has a son, and she believes, and thus names, Seth as meaning appointed. The word Seth comes from a root implying appointed. This verse is going to be important to us when we get to chapter 5. Because we want to understand what the name Seth means, and it means appointed. And verse 25 of chapter 4 is our authority. The next verse, and Seth, to him, also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then man, began men to call upon the name of the Lord, is what your King James translation says. And it astonishes me to discover that most commentators accept that without looking at it more closely. In the English, you get the impression, he calls his name Enos, and then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. You know, if you stop and think about it, that doesn't make any sense. You mean Adam didn't? You mean Abel didn't? And Seth didn't? No. That's not, see, the problem is, that's not what it says. That's the way it's been translated. And uh, the apostasy begins with Enos. Genesis 4.25 should be translated, I believe. Then men began to profane the name of the Lord. This is the beginning of the apostasy. If you study the Hebrew sources, there is a translation called the Ankylos translation of the Old Testament. In Jewish communities, scholastic communities, it is known as the translation. The, the Targum of Ankylos is considered by many as the authoritative text especially for some of these early manuscripts. And what the Targum of Ankala says, then men desisted from praying in the name of the Lord. If you look at another document called the Targum of Jonathan, these are all rabbinical sources, it says they surnamed their idols in the name of the Lord. And if you look at uh, the Kimchi, Rashi, even Jerome, they all agree to this. Maimonides, who is probably the most venerated of the Hebrew sages, he published his commentary on the Mishnah, in 11, which is part of the Talmud, uh, of the, uh, the Talmud uh, in the 12th century, 1168. He ascribes the origin of idolatry to the days of Enosh. 
So it's unfortunate that the la Genesis 4.25, the last verse of chapter 4, is mistranslated. We need to understand, for a lot of other things that are come up, that, prof that this is where apostasy is beginning. Up till now, gee, they've made their mistakes, they're still sinners, but they observed the Lord. Now we're starting to see apostasy, apostasy set in. So, okay, let, that concludes our quick skim of chapter 4. Let's go look at chapter 5. But before I do, I want to ask you a question. Many of you that are familiar with our, our materials probably are familiar with the material that's coming, forthcoming. But are there hidden messages in the Bible? There are many scholars that say there are no such things. And uh, unfortunately, the Bible is, uh, that, 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 is, that, that uh, view is brutally assaulted by the facts. Um, Proverbs 25.2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing and the honor of kings to search out a matter. God has put treasures here for our learning if we'll take the trouble to discover them. I want to give you a riddle. Who is the oldest man in the Bible? Anyone? Methuselah. Methuselah. You're right on. Exactly. Yet he died before. He lived 969 years. Yet he died before his father. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you looked ahead. All right. Okay. Oh, yeah, you're right. Everybody forgets whose father his father was Enoch. And uh, Enoch didn't die. He was, excuse the expression, raptured. But at, he, at the age of 65, Enoch had an experience of some kind because from that day on, it says he walked with God, and he does over 300 years. He lived to be 365. So at the age of 65, something happened that caused him for the next 300 years, the rest of his life, to walk with God. Now, his, his son is named Methuselah. The name Methuselah comes from a root that means death. Muth means death. It occurs 125 times in the Old Testament. And the verb shalak, which means to bring or send forth, that comes up 60 times in the Old Testament, usually to bring forth a judgment. So the name Methuselah, the combination of those two roots, means his death shall bring. You say, boy, that's kind of a strange name for a kid. You see, one of the things you need to understand, we'll go into this when we get to chapter 6, the flood of Noah did not come as a surprise. It had been preached on for four generations. They knew a flood, that those that were listening knew a judgment was coming. Enoch was given a prophecy. He's given several. I'll talk about another one he got too, but he, he's given a prophecy that as long as his son is alive, the judgment of the flood would be withheld. So he named him, his death shall bring. That's a pretty weird thing. Can you imagine girls raising that kid? Every time he caught a cold, the neighborhood would go into panic, right? <laughs> Methuselah lives 187 years. He has a son by the name of Lamech. We'll talk more about him in a minute. And Lamech lives 182 years, and he has a son by the name of Noah. How many of you have heard of Noah? About 80%. Well, we've got a problem. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. And of course, Noah, it's in his 600th year that the flood comes. If you do your arithmetic, you'll discover that Methuselah, the year that Methuselah dies is the year the flood came. His life was a prophecy. His life was a prophecy of mercy. If his life is a prophecy of mercy, it's not accidental that his life is the longest lifetime in the Bible. Because it, 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 the point that God is making that he has, he is a merciful God. His mercy extends beyond that which you would expect. But it's also finite. There is a point at which even that has its limits. So I want to talk a little bit. In Genesis chapter 5, we're going to encounter a genealogy of ten people. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Ten guys. If there's all this meaning tucked away behind the name of Methuselah, what about the rest of these guys? Now, we have a problem here because there are many, very few people have the resources to try to unravel proper names. If you look at Strong's Concordance, these typical concordances, they don't deal with proper names. We don't ourselves translate proper names. My formal legal name is Charles. What does Charles mean? No one's quite sure. They try to link it to Charlemagne, or they, there's all kinds of conjectures in the little pamphlets you might find, but they don't know. We, this, it's been lost in antiquity. Whatever your name means, some of you probably have names that which we, we don't know what they mean. In Hebrew, all the words in Hebrew are built of three-letter roots. 
and the roots have meaning. In fact, I won't take the time tonight, but it's worth your while to discover that there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And if you find how those letters were written before the Babylonian captivity, they were written in a little different way, but in a way that represented something visual. And, and if you learn what those letters mean, you can interpret about 80% of the Hebrew. The University of, uh, the, uh, University of Arizona's Hebrew department pointed this out to me. It came, uh, uh, they pointed out to me that they've discovered that if they teach the kids how the Hebrew was originally written and learn what those letters mean, then they can read about 80% of the Hebrew. Because the Hebrew alphabet is not just phonetic, like most alphabets, it's also uh, carries, the, uh, carries, it's concept driven. Uh, uh, Aleph, the first letter of the alphabet, is first letter, so it means first or leader, right? Aleph, it's, it's like a, well, it's similar to, uh, it actually was written like a, a sort of like, a, it's what we, uh, like an ox's head, a ho long horn, uh, horns with a skull. So it meant, Strength or leader, that's what Aleph means. Bet was like a little line with a teepee on it. It later becomes our B, but Bet in the Hebrew is, it meant house. So if you Aleph and a Bet, it's the leader of the house. Aleph, Bet, Ab. It's the name for father. You take He, which is a breath, which means spirit. You put that in the middle of the word, it's the essence of that word. If you take a He and put it between the Aleph and the Bet, you have the spirit, the essence of the Father. It's Ahab, the word for love. Love is the essence of the Father. See, what I'm getting at is you can build the meaning of the words if you understand the meaning of the letters. In English or most other languages, the letters are strictly phonetic. And you have to put them together and then learn what that word means, you see. But the Hebrew uh, is built from roots. And so, uh, to track some, if you're trying to figure out what proper names mean, you've got to get into the Hebrew roots. And there are sources for that, but they're usually hard to come by. But let's take a look and see what we can put together with the genealogy here. Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, and this is the book of the generations of Adam. In other words, this is the genealogy, the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God, made he him. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam. Adam's not the guy, it's the combination. They're one flesh. We can get into a whole thing there, but another day. In the day in which they were created, and Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. I want you to know something. Adam, both Mr. and Mrs. Adam, were in the likeness of God. He created them directly. They are sons of God. Bar, Elohim, and, uh, and the woman too. Um, Seth is not a son of God. He's a son of Adam. You and I are sons of Adam. We're not sons of God unless we've been born again. John chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. Jesus speaking of Jesus. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. That's not just a spiritual phrase. It's a very definitive statement that's explained in chapter 3 of John. Being born again is not just a, a, a spiritual idiom. It's a very, very important event. You're a new creation in Christ. But let's move on, moving on here. Okay, he called his name Seth. Okay, now what does Seth mean? Did we remember what Seth meant? What did Eve tell you Seth meant? Appointed. Appointed. Good for you. Adam is easy. Adam means man. I could have asked you that. It must get Adam on. It means man. The days of Adam after he begotten Seth were 800 years. He begot sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. And Seth lived 105 years and begot Enos. Now, Seth means appointed. As, as Eve explained back in... Chapter 4, verse 25. Seth lived after he begot Enos 807 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. You know, many people who read 5, many of the commentators, you go through 5, all they see is he died, so and so, and he died. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a book of death. No, that's because they haven't done the homework to translate it. See, you and I have it all translated except for the proper names. Seth, Enos, those are untrans they're transliterated. They're English approximations of how they're pronounced but they're untranslated. We're going to try to translate them. We've got, we got Adam, Seth, let's take Enosh. What does Enosh mean? The, it, it comes from a root which means mortal, frail, or miserable. It's a, it's a, it comes from the root Anash, which is a root which means incurable. It's usually used of a wound, or grief, or woe, or sickness, or wickedness. It's, uncur it's incurable. Let's call it mortal. Enosh lived 90 years and begot Canaan. 
And this is an unfortunate translation because the Canaan is actually Aramaic. The Hebrew would be Kenan. But anyway, the, the Enos lived after he begot Kenan uh, 815 years, and he begot sons and daughters, and all the days of Enos were 905 years, and he died. Kenan, which can mean sorrow or dirge or elegy. Pretty grim words, actually. And can you, ma can you imagine uh, raising that kid? Uh, choosing up basketball teams. Hey, sorrow, you're on our team. It doesn't work, does it? Well, neither does Edosh. You're incurable, but you're on our side. Anyway. And Kenan uh, lived 70 years and begot Mahalalel. Now, I assume that he got tired of he and his father and his grandfather, these, these grim names. So when he got his son, he gave him a mouthful. But boy, it's a great name. Mahalalel. After, I'll come in a minute. After he lived, he begot Mahalalel 840 years, begot sons and daughters, and the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. Mahalalel, it's, it's root two words. Mahalal, which means blessed or praised one. And El, which is the name of God. So Mahalalel means the blessed God or the praised God. A mouthful, but a great name. Can you imagine having the name of God in your, in your handle? That's pretty good. Mahalalel lived 65 years and begot Yared. And Mahalalel lived after he begot Yared 830 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Mahalalel were 890 and five years. And he died. Now Yared is easy one because Yarad is a Hebrew verb meaning shall come down. Now, when you get to Genesis 6, you learn about some strange things that came down upon the earth. And it could be, it's conjectured by some, that that stuff may have started in the days of this kid. And that's why he was named Yared shall come down. That may be prophetic. We don't know. But anyway, he's called Yared. And Yared lived 60 and 2 years and begot Enoch. And he, and he lived after he begot Enoch 800 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Yared were 960 and 2 years. And he died. Now we have Enoch. We've talked about Enoch. This is one of the most interesting guys in the Bible, by the way. Um, but his name means, it's, a, it's an academic term, meaning commencement or teaching. Teaching, we'll say, Enoch. It's interesting, the oldest prophecy in the Bible uttered by a prophet is by Enoch. It's, you'll find it not in, in the Torah, you'll find it in the book of Jude, the one just before Revelation. The brother of Jesus Christ, he wrote an epistle. He says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, he's talking about the end times, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Seems to have a vocabulary restriction here on part of the translators, but anyway... Uh, and godly shows up four times in one sentence. But, but the point is, this is an interesting prophecy. It's a prophecy of the second coming of Jesus Christ that was uttered before the flood of Noah. I think that's kind of interesting. It, it tells us four things. We know that the Lord's coming is sure. And it's absolutely certain. It's even mentioned, in, 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 in a sense, in the past tense. And that's exactly the way the Bible often talks about it. Even Revelation 19 is in, in the past tense thing. See, so it's like history. Can't change, nothing can change it. Because, it, you know, Philip in 3 Timothy, he's going to subdue all things to himself. And the second thing we know, we know who will accompany him. His holy myriads. And who are they? They find the myriads in other passages. Zechariah 14.5, Revelation 19.14, Daniel 7.10, and so forth. And uh, Moses talks about Deuteronomy 33, the, the myriads of his holy ones. Uh, angels in the sense of Acts 7.53, Galatians 3.19. And Christ returned in Matthew 25, 31. All the, all the holy angels will come with him. And yet the believers also, according to Colossians 3, 4 and uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, 13. And uh, third thing we know from this prophecy is that we know the purpose of his coming. And uh, both the first and the last prophecy in the Bible deal, focuses on the second coming of Jesus Christ. And he'll come to bring judgment. And uh, according to Hebrews 9, 26. And uh, so forth. And... Uh, and we know the result of his coming, of course, and that will be that, uh, that uh, yeah, he will, uh, uh, all the ungodly will be convicted of all the works of ungodliness and so forth and so on. Pretty straightforward. Um, all the books open and uh, the final judgment. I might mention, by the way, there are three groups of people that face the flood of Noah. We're going to talk about this when we get to chapter 6 next time. Those that perished in the flood, of course, those that were preserved through the flood, and those that were removed prior to the flood. And I'm going to suggest to you that Enoch was not post-flood or mid-flood. He was pre-flood. Okay. You, did you, that, that, that went by you? Okay, sorry. It's interesting, at the depth of apostasy, we have Enoch, 
who was translated, that was midway between Adam and Abraham. Elijah was translated midway between Abraham and Christ, both ministering in a nadir of apostasy, both translated. Kind of interesting. And the church will probably be translated at the nadir of apostasy, which we're rapidly plunging to. When we've got one of the most conservative channels on television doing a week-long thing this week of the war on Christianity, the reality of the war against Christians. That you, you, you know, that, uh, anyway. Verse 21, and Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah 300 years and he begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not. God took him. So I'll call that being raptured. In Hebrews 11.4, we looked at that. Hebrews 11.5 says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. And before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Oh, if that could be said of us, if we somehow, through intense prayer and commitment and resolve, could just walk so to please God. Enoch walked with God. That was not a casual th stroll. That lasted 300 years. And uh, that included, according to Amos 3, 3, involved agreement, surrender, and witness. Those are three important things. That privilege that Enoch had is available to you and me. Galatians 2 6, Galatians 5, I mean Colossians 2 6, Galatians 5 25, 2 Corinthians 5 7. You and I should be aspiring to walk with God, to please Him. And I think that would make us eligible for Rapture 2, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be exciting? Interesting parallel there. Methuselah, as we've talked about, it means his death shall bring. I've talked about that. He lived, 180, he lived 187 years, begot Lamech. Then he lived, after he begot Lamech, 782 years, begot sons and daughters. All the days of Methuselah were 960 and 9 years, and he died. A lot of people have trouble with these long longevities, by the way, but you'll notice that they'll gradually decline. Um, uh, there's all kinds of scientific conjectures as to why. Some of this has to do with radiation. Some of it might have the decline of the human genome um, and so forth. Uh, we are all victims of these little diagrams in National Geographic and what have you of the ascent of man you know, from apes up and so forth. We reject evolution, but we still fall prey to that mentality. We assume that these guys were idiots, not as smart as we are. It may be the other way around. <laughs> they were much closer to God. There's things they knew that we have, are still beginning to discover, not necessarily in technology, but, uh, uh, but anyway. Uh, so I'm not going to get into the ge genealogy, except to say that I think we, uh, we have no, no embarrassment in just accepting them what they say. And I told you, I'm explaining the year of the flood was the year that no, no, uh, Methuselah dies, the year of the flood. But then we get to Lamech. Now, here's what root that we have that's still in our language today, a lament or lamentation. It means, the root means despairing. I think it echoes what we read in chapter 4 with the, the poem that, uh, Lamech told, that, that the Lamech of Cain uh, read to his wives. Lamech, this Lamech, uh, lived 182 years, begot a son, and called his name Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us. What does the word Noah mean? You can tell from this verse. It means comfort or rest. Okay? So it's, designed, it's, it's from Nacham, which means to bring relief or comfort. Comfort or rest. So now you say, gee, Chuck, you've given us a lot of dry vocabulary work here. Why? Well, we have a genealogy in Genesis 5 that's not translated in your Bible. It's transliterated. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Nahalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Knowing what we now know, having explored the roots and the meaning of these words as revealed in the scripture. Um, oh, I forgot to mention, I think I slipped by Kenan, by the way. Kenan, uh, Kenites, is, uh, when Balaam at the Numbers was looking over, he made a pun on the Kenites. So we, we know some of this from the scripture. I may have missed that. Anyway, Adam means man, right? Seth means appointed. Man is appointed mortal sorrow. But the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring, whose death? God's death shall bring the despairing comfort or rest. Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing comfort or rest. If these words in any other order, it wouldn't make sense. And here it is, a summary of the Christian gospel tucked away here in the Torah in chapter 5. Now, there's no, this has a lot of implications. First of all, 
There's no way you'll ever convince me that a group of Jewish rabbis contrived to hide a summary of the Christian gospel in a genealogy within their highly venerated Torah, the books of Moses. No way. No way. And many will quibble, quibble that some of these roots could mean something else. And fine, if the, uh, uh, from my point of view, it's like you're, 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 you're in an ancient garden. You push through the ivy, there's a wall, and there's a door in the wall. And down in the ivy, you find a key. You can argue all day why that key works the door. The easy way is to put it in the door and see if it opens the door. If it opens the door, it's the key to the door. <laughs> so that's the way I regard this. Okay, anyway. Um, but there's another implication here, too. And that is that God's plan of redemption was not a knee-jerk reaction to the surprise that Adam blew it. When did God first start dealing with you? Ephesians 1.4 tells you before the foundation of the world, God had you on his mind. And God laid out, knew that Adam would get us all in a predicament that nothing less than the death of God would prevail to get us out of this predicament. And yet he went forward in this as a demonstration of just how much a God can love. We talk about infinite power, infinite knowledge, all these infinitudes about God. How do you demonstrate an infinite love? Jesus told us. Greater love has no man than he that lays down his life for his friends. Jesus Christ willingly went to the cross for you and me. One integrated design. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. The Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. And we're going to see evidence. Of the evi you'll find evidence of this on every page of not just the book of Genesis, but the entire Bible. Let's just finish this up. Lamech lived after he begot Noah 595 years, and he begot sons and daughters. All the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died, and Noah was 500 years old, and he begot Ham, Shem, and Japheth. One other thing I forgot, as we went by Cain, and he, had, he knew his wife and had a child. Every, I don't know why it is, the most popular question is the most irrelevant question of this entire chapter. Who did Cain marry? Where did he get his wife? He married his brother's sister because he was able. <laughs> right? No? That's pretty bad. In the, I, had, I had to work that in. I had to work that in. He obviously married the family, but the family was very extensive. So who did he marry? It's, not, it's, it's no mystery to anyone that understands. understands. No, it's 500 years, and he begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And we're going to talk a lot about them next time. The next session, we're going to ask some questions next time. Why did God send the flood? Well, because the earth was sinful. Well, if that's the case, we better get some life jackets. <laughs> Why did God send the flood? Some very strange thing background here. And uh, I had a, by the way, I had a delightful letter from Tim LaHaye. Just got arrived yesterday. Congratulating us on how the trial came out that we've been, you know, dealing with. And, uh, but he also says, Chuck, you finally convinced me. Because Tim was one of these guys that never really bought the Nephilim thing that we did. And he's been researching that. And he wrote me a letter saying he, he's, he's joined our side, so to speak, which has encouraged you. Most, most conservative scholars are in that view, by the way. But he also was very, very generous in his, in his support of the ministry, and both emotionally and otherwise. What did Jesus mean when he warned us, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be? In order to stand that, understand that remark in Matthew 24, you need to understand the days of Noah. The, the, the purpose for the flood is every bit as important, if not more so, than the flood itself. So we're going to talk about that next time. And who on earth were the Nephilim, the fallen ones? We'll talk about that next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. We have Cain and Abel tonight. We have the, the first Pharisee, in a sense, the first professional religionist. And we had those that simply approached God on the basis that he has to be approached upon by the sacrifice of blood. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we do praise you for your word. We thank you, Father, that you have gone to such extremes, indeed, from before the foundation of the world to work out a plan for our redemption. We thank you, Father, for that plan. We thank you, Father, for the gift of the kinsman redeemer whose completed work avails for our salvation. We thank you, too, Father, for your Holy Spirit that has brought us to this point in our lives. 
We thank you, Father, that in your kingdom there are no accidents, no coincidences, that we're all right here where you have ordained us to be. We pray, Father, that you'd give us discernment to recognize what it is you'd have of each of us in these days that are upon us. As we reflect, Father, the ministries, the many ministries, Elijah and Enoch and others in the days of apostasy, as we recognize the dark clouds of apostasy on our own horizon, we pray, Father, that you give us discernment and resolve that you would shield us and protect us and that you would continue to equip us that we each might be more fruitful stewards of the opportunities before us as we commit ourselves by faith, as Abel did, into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, the Lamb that was slain on our behalf. Amen.